Good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week with a little bit of uh, Q&A regarding the war in Israel. Let me open us in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, we thank you for your kindness to us. We recognize we don't get what we deserve. Uh, in fact, we get grace upon grace. Lord, we're thankful for this weekend and a time to express gratitude. And we do that far too little. And we just want even this morning to express our thanks to you for so many good things. Uh, we know this is a broken and fallen world. And yet even in it, we see uh, your generosity, your kindness, your lavish bounty. And so we just give you thanks. We ask in our time now that you would be honored, uh, that your word would speak clearly, uh, that our perspectives would be conformed in greater measure to your own. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we began a little bit of a, a Q&A regarding the current war in Israel, uh, begun October 7th. Uh, by terrorists uh, invading Israel, uh, killing civilians, taking hostages, and then, of course, Israel's response. I received a few questions over the course of this week that I'll just begin with those, kind of first come, first serve, early bird gets the worm. Um, Eric Martin has the microphone this morning, so he's going to ask all the rest of the questions. No, he's going <laughs> to wander around. If you have a question, put your hand up. Uh, and Eric will come find you and give you an opportunity with the microphone. Uh, one question I received this week was, why is there so much hate for Israel in the world right now? Uh, that's a really good question, and, and I think there are probably a, a couple of ways to answer that. I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there are anti-Israel and pro-Hamas protests and parades and celebrations in many of the major cities of the world. There was a parade in Tempe, there are riots in London, New York City has had parades and protests and riots. And, and some people wave Palestinian flags, but other mo more overtly will put on the Hamas headdress uh, and, and openly celebrate uh, the, a demise in Israel, the killing of civilians. Uh, you may have heard the chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, right? What does that mean? That means from the, the river Jordan to the Mediterranean Sea, Palestine is to be liberated. Liberated of what? Liberated of the occupation or liberated of the existence of Jews. That is what that phrase means. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. It means we don't want any Jews to live here anymore. All the Jews have been expelled from the other 50 or so Muslim and Arab nations of the world. And those that are hostile to Israel today want to see them eradicated from the land itself. So um, why does that exist? Uh, you, you may have seen the, the commercial airlines flight that was taking people out of Israel when the war started. Uh, they were trying to get somewhere safe and a commercial flight with many Jews from Israel landed in Russia, and people found out that it was a commercial flight out of Israel. They actually stormed the airport, broke through the windows, got out onto the tarmac, climbed onto the plane looking for Jews to harm and kill. Uh, thankfully, security was there soon enough to escort the Jews from Israel off the plane into a secure location. But why is all of that happening? Um, why, why would people celebrate an organization like Hamas, whose Arabic word just simply means violence, whose constitutional purpose is the annihilation or the eradication of Jews? Well, in one sense, there's nothing new here. I, I would see probably two threads. One is the, the Marxist thread in our world today. Uh, Marxism basically breaks the world into two classes. You have the oppressor class and the oppressed class. And if you're oppressed, then you have a right to any means necessary, any means are justified to overthrow the oppressors. This is why Israel is being called an apartheid state. The oppressed and oppressor class is synonymous now with those that are colonizers and those that are colonized. 
And those that are colonized have every right to overthrow the yoke of the colonizers. That, that sort of Marxist bifurcation of classes justifies any level of violence, murder, brutality to accomplish the end goal of freedom of the oppressed. Of course, what happens when the oppressed are actually free in the Marxist regime? You get those totalitarian communist regimes um, that became the oppressors in return. So um, that's one thread. And, and I think the Marxist thread is particularly appealing in the 20th century, late 20th century, early 21st century, and to the young. As Marxism was taught in all the major universities in the Western world, it was picked up by youth, the 50s, the 60s, and forward. And in one sense, we are reaping the global consequence of that ideology. But the second thread, and this th second thread has deeper pockets, historically speaking. Uh, it is sa Satan's hatred for God's people, rooted in Satan's hatred for God's promises, God's covenant loyalty to himself, God's purposes, and for God. For Satan, throughout history, God identifying a people. Corey, it's so good to see you today. Thank you for being here. We're just praising God at his care for you this week. It's good to see you. Um, the, the other thread here is Satan's hatred for God's people. And throughout Israel's history, uh, we have seen satanic attacks against God's people of promise. And so uh, that, that really is the deep behind the scenes thread here. There is a ruler of this world, a God of this world, small g God of this world, uh, who is Satan, who is opposed to God's purposes. So it's not like we're seeing some weird, strange flare-up in geopolitics in the last month. We're seeing the same old thing. And this same old thing is actually will, will terminate in the, the culmination of all of human history when all the nations of the world will ally themselves against Israel and Messiah himself will come to the earth and defend Jerusalem and its people. Here's a second question I received this week. Is all of this happening to Israel because they rejected the gospel? And the answer to that is, is um, probably not straightforward, black and white, super simple. But I want to chase a couple of threads in Scripture. Look at Luke 19. The, the question of causality is a, is a challenging one because we have ultimate agents, intermediate agents, uh, and immediate agents. That means God is the sovereign orchestrator of all things. And in one very real sense, everything has its foundation in God's decree and God's purpose. But intermediate agents are those forces of evil that have evil machinations, evil plans, and do evil things. And God is sovereign. He can use evil things, evil people, evil motives to accomplish his good purposes. Right? Case in point, Romans 8.28. All things work together for good to those who love him, called according to his purpose. That includes evil things. Right? Genesis 50.20. Joseph's brothers threw him in a hole, and Joseph said... You meant this for evil. God simultaneously meant it for good. And of course, the cross of Christ where Jesus was crucified is the apex example of the worst crime in human history, deicide, being orchestrated by God to accomplish His good purposes to save us sinners. So, in one sense, nothing new here. Um, when we think about the causality of, of why these things are happening to Israel, we have all those same elements. Ultimately, it's, this is God's plan, right? You, you, you look at what God is doing on the, on the pages of history. But in an immediate sense, Luke 19.44 gives us Jesus' indictment of the nation, Back to verse 1, Jesus is approaching the city of Jerusalem. He saw it and wept over it. This moment here, Luke 19.41, is a fulfillment of Daniel 9.24-27 down to the day. The exact day that Messiah would arrive, according to Daniel's prophecy, 
in Jerusalem. And, and what does Messiah see when he approaches the cities, cresting the, the Mount of Olives, coming down the hill, looking into the city? An apostate nation, a corrupt spiritual leadership, a moral bankruptcy, and they do not recognize him. In fact, they want to kill him. Verse 42, Jesus said, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you, surround you, hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground and your children within you. They will not leave in you one stone upon another. Why? Because, here's our causality, you did not recognize the time of your visitation. 483 years to the day from Nehemiah 2, Messiah was there. And what is the result? The, the immediate result of that, or, or close result of that, was A.D. 70, when the Roman general Titus Vespasian rolls through and literally removes every stone from the temple grounds and throws them off the foundation down to the, the pavement uh, many stories below. There was not a stone left on top of another. It was raised flat. And all of this came to pass. And, and what has happened ever since? Well, this, this is what God has referred to as the times of the Gentiles. You go back to Daniel chapter 2 and the statue vision given to Nebuchadnezzar, a series of four empires uh, from Babylon to the Medo-Persians to the Greeks to Rome in two parts, Rome 1.0, Rome 2.0, and space in between where Messiah is cut off. And this... From the, from the time of the Babylonian captivity all the way into the future until we get to the Revelation 19, still to come. Uh, we have this period called the times of the Gentiles. So in one sense, uh, Israel's experience, think about all the awful things that the nation of Israel has been through, the Jewish people have been through over the course of history, even down into modern history has been features, have been features of this times of the Gentiles. Israel out of the land, not having autonomy as a nation, all of it as a result of not being faithful to Yahweh. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 13. This goes back farther than simply their rejection of Christ when he came in Jeremiah 13, the prophet Jeremiah is commanded by the Lord to, to wear a waistband, to have it buried in the ground and then be ruined, and then it doesn't work as a waistband anymore. It's totally worthless. Verse 8 of Jeremiah 13, God explains this sort of physical parable. The word of Yahweh came to me saying, Thus says Yahweh, just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts and have gone after other gods to serve them and to bow down to them, let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. For as the waistband clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares Yahweh, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory. But they did not listen. But this goes back a lot farther than Luke 19 and the triumphal entry. Uh, this goes back to Israel in all of her eras forsaking covenant. Yahweh promised, I'll bless you if you obey me. I'll curse you and disperse you if you disobey. And Israel is living as a nation under the consequences of her disobedience. It will, of course, not always be this way. You have the promises of the new covenant. By the way, every new covenant promise was made to Israel. I know we love the new covenant and, and we get to participate in the spiritual benefits of the new covenant as Gentiles, but we do so as ingrafted branches, outsiders, brought in by God's grace. We Gentiles should be saying, I, I, I don't deserve to be reading this book, to be worshiping this Messiah. Uh, to, to have the spiritual benefits of these promises in the rich root of the olive tree of the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What am I doing here? It's all mercy. And Israel was given the promises 
had forsaken faithfulness to the covenant promises and also was promised the new covenant. So Deuteronomy 10, God commands them, circumcise your hearts. In Deuteronomy 30, God says, I will circumcise your hearts. By the way, that comes after the promises for blessing if they obey, the curses for uh, their disobedience, and the promise in Deuteronomy 29, God says, you will disobey. I know you will. God told them that before they ever even got into the land and disobeyed. He knew how this was going to go. And in that same sermon that Moses delivers before they enter the land, the next chapter, Deuteronomy 30, God promises, I will (laughs) circumcise your hearts. I will do that internal, supernatural heart surgery that you can't accomplish for yourselves. This is gospel to Israel, promised long ago. It's echoed in all the great new covenant passages, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36 and 37. Over and over and over again, God says, I will bring about a spiritual renewal for Israel. What's fascinating is when you get to Romans chapter 11, you discover this same truth. Okay, this is New Testament. This ought to remind us that uh, God has not forsaken his old plans or traded them out, picked a different people, or any of those kinds of things. Romans 11.1, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? Well, what people is he talking about? He tells us right here. May it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. And then he gives a a number of scriptural demonstrations of that reality. Look down at verse 11. I say then, they, meaning Israel, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And in the strongest words possible, Paul says, may it never be, but by their transgression, that is Israel, by Israel's transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, if Israel's transgression is riches for the world and Israel's failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will Israel's fulfillment be? You see what God is doing right now? Times of the Gentiles. Gentiles are coming to faith in Israel's Messiah through the gospel preached. But there's a day coming. Look down at verse 25. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of this mystery. So that, here's an important ethical consideration for us, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Now, what's the temptation? Well, I'm a Gentile. Jews had their chance. Good riddance. By the way, this was a sentiment that came out in church history over time. Uh, Golden Mouth uh, is the nickname for a a fourth century preacher. His name's Chrysostom. Literally, his name means Golden Mouth. He was uh, an expository preacher in the fourth century. And he described the Jews nationally as those who killed Christ. And in his wake came those who called Jews ethnically Christ killers. And you can see where this goes. In one sense, there's something in there. I mean, it was the the nation that rejected Jesus. It was the Jewish mob that, that said, crucify him, crucify him. And it was the Romans that put him on the cross physically. It was the Jewish religious establishment that rejected Jesus. But ever since the first century, there were, of course, Jews who believed the gospel. In fact, almost the entirety of the church on the first day was Jewish. And so there's a, there's a fine line between recognizing Israel's rejection of the gospel and God's rejection of Israel. He, he has not rejected them. He still calls them his people. What is their current status? A partial hardening has happened to them, verse 25. Until, there's a time marker. Until when? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Apparently, God's not done saving Gentiles because he hasn't softened Israel's heart nationally yet. But when he does, verse 26, all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He'll remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them, Israel, when I take away their sins. There's that Jeremiah 31, new covenant text. And then you get this dual status of Israel now. From the standpoint of the gospel, Israel are enemies for the church's sake. 
But from the standpoint of God's choice, Israel is beloved for the sake of the fathers. Why? For the gifts, what God gives, and the calling of God are irrevocable. Can't be taken away, can't be changed, can't be abrogated, can't be transferred. Uh, This is God's commitment. So, uh, is all of this happening to Israel because they rejected the gospel? Yes, it goes back farther and deeper than that. Um, And intermediate causality has to do with evil people who do evil things. Uh, Hitler was evil. Hamas is evil. Uh, That's just plain evil. And the ultimate agent behind all of this is God in his sovereign working to reduce Israel's pride one day to bring her to repentance and faith. Okay, that gets to another question that came out this week. Um, What should I do if I meet an Israeli? (laughs) Tell them the gospel. (laughs) Preach the gospel. Open God's word. And and I would suggest uh, Daniel 9 and Isaiah 53. A little inside information. Jews today are not encouraged to read past Torah, to to read past the first five books of the Bible. Uh, They're actually discouraged from reading the prophets. In fact, in the early 1800s, for a long time, up until the early 1800s, the the Jewish thought was that the Isaiah text of Isaiah 53, the one that more clearly, densely, completely preaches the gospel than I think any other text in the Bible is this Old Testament prophetic text in Isaiah 53 that lays out exactly who Jesus is, what he's going to do, uh, what he accomplishes by his death, his glorification, his intercession for his people, and his return and fulfillment. I mean, it's, it's all there in Isaiah 53, and it's so crystal clear. The Jewish response was, well, the Christians got into the Isaiah text and they fiddled with it. They put Jesus in there after the fact. And then, of course, the, the Bedouin shepherds throwing rocks in a cave heard the smashing of clay jars, went up there and figured out, oh, there, there's some stuff inside these jars. It made it to a couple of dealers and then eventually discovered, whoa, these are scrolls. These are scrolls of Scripture. And these scrolls predate Christ. The scrolls are older than Jesus' birth at Bethlehem. And the Isaiah 53 text of those Dead Sea Scrolls is identical to the Isaiah 53 text that we have today. This isn't Christian meddling. This is actually what Isaiah wrote. This is what God said 700 years before Christ came, that Messiah would do these things, die in the place of sinners to justify the many. And Israel has rejected her Messiah. So it's actually wonderful to appeal to Jews on the basis of their own book, which promises Jesus of Nazareth as Messiah. And it's not specific to his name. But Daniel 9 is interesting because Daniel 9 locates the arrival of Messiah in a timeline that can't be matched by anybody else. That Messiah had to come before the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 and had to come 483 years after Nehemiah's uh, declaration. That's a, that's a narrow window. Who else fits? <laughs> Who meets the criteria for Messiah? Nobody but Jesus of Nazareth. So if you meet an Israeli, if you meet a Jew, preach the gospel. The reality is, Jews don't get special privilege, protection, or heaven simply by riding Abraham's coattails. In fact, the Bible says the otherwise. A Jew, a true Jew, is one who is spiritual, a Jew inwardly. In other words, one by belief, one by new birth, one by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean a true Jew is a Gentile who's born again. It means a true Jew is a born-again Jew, a spiritual Jew. And so uh, they need the gospel, which is why Israel won't receive the promised land. Israel has not yet received the promised land. Uh, Not in the conquest, not in David and Solomon's day, uh, not in 1948. Nowhere yet have they reached the, the boundaries that were promised. And they will not 
until there is repentance and faith in the gospel. So preach the gospel. Similar question, what should I do if I meet a Hamas terrorist? Um, Unarmed. (laughs) Uh, I'll let you decide your just war theory and work out your ethics, uh, you know, if he's armed. But an unarmed Hamas terrorist, what should you do? Preach the gospel. You're dealing with an image bearer. A human created in the image of God who is in rebellion against his maker who needs to know Christ. And listen, if you believe that you are better than him, uh, deserving of the gospel more than him, you don't understand the gospel, you don't understand yourself, you don't understand God and his holiness. You and I ought to be driven by compassion for every swath of humanity on the earth. We ought to be praying for the salvation of people who don't know Christ. And whatever your circles are, where they intersect with people who might disagree with you politically, who might be on the other side of some military line, the gospel is primary. Preach the gospel, pray. Pray for your enemies, Jesus said. Uh, This question came to me after Sunday, what should I do at work? If people are wearing Palestinian pins or Israeli pins or they've got flags on their desk, in other words, uh, what, do you, what do you do in, a, in an office space where there's fighting over, you know, who are you siding with? And, and now we live in such a polarized culture that you have to pick teams. <laughs> well, I don't want any teams. I just want Jesus. Yeah, you're not allowed. Uh, which flag are you going to fly? And, and there's these debates in the cubicles. Right? And, and that's the polite form. Uh, we'll talk about the impolite form in a moment. Uh, but but what do you, so what do you do? Uh, where, where, how do we handle a situation where maybe family members, friends, coworkers, colleagues, people we interact with, uh, people just out on the street are waving the flags of their various loyalties? Let me just ask you this, Christian, what are we to be known for? What are we to be known for? We are to be known for our loyalty to Christ, right? Philippians 3.20 says, our citizenship is where? Texas. No, that's not what it says. America. No, our, our citizenship is in heaven. Present tense. Your home is a place you've never been. Your life is to be governed by your home's priorities, ethics, morality, affiliations. I I love the line by the Christian singer years ago, uh, Rich Mullins. He said, I will call this land my country, but it is not my home. There's an okay way to be patriotic. There are appropriate ways to be patriotic. You can be thankful for the place that you live, the place you come from, your heritage, culture, all those things. But if you're a Christian, your identity is in Christ, your citizenship is in heaven, and your home is not here. What does that mean for us? Um, It means broadcast your loyalties and don't get caught up in temporary squabbles, just as a principle. It's appropriate to stand up for right and wrong in the world. And again, think about what we talked about last week. There is not a moral equivalence between Hamas terrorists or Hezbollah terrorists or uh, Islamic Jihad and Palestine terrorists or the Iranians who are backing them with Israel's self-defense as a nation. There's not a moral equivalence between those things. Uh, However, my loyalties ultimately are with Christ who has purchased with his own blood people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. So we have to be very careful uh, in our upholding right and wrong in the world. Even a formulation of a just war theory or the right of self-defense or any of those things. um, We have to marry those to the ultimate eternal realities that go with what it means to belong to Jesus, what it means to be a citizen of heaven. All right, here's the impolite version of the question. How should I conduct myself on social media? Don't. (laughs) Okay, that's not the real answer. That's just my answer. (laughs) I can't. I don't. Um, 
So you, you, you can do with my uh, own preferences and practices, whatever you want. Um, but if social media involves communication, it falls under the biblical rubric of speech, which means maybe the next time before you post on social media and send, or the next time you like something impulsively, just read the whole book of Proverbs. And if you want to narrow it down, just work through the whole book of Proverbs and make a list of all the Proverbs on speech and communication and apply them not just to the vocal word, but to the typed word, the blasted word. And then read James 1 and then read James 3 and recognize how great a forest is set on fire by a small spark and the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity, and is itself set on fire by hell. Listen, all those keyboards, they're gonna burn. Fingers that type are doing the same thing that tongues that wag. So practice biblical self-control, biblical communication principles in social media. And just know that what gets typed and sent is out there. It has a permanence to it. Um, and I would just advise you to not. <laughs> or be mature and do it well. And there are many who are mature and do it well. I'm not in that category. I dropped out of that race. Um, that, that's a tough one for me. All right, anybody have any questions? I have one that I'll close with. But opportunity for you, if you have a question about the war in Israel now or how we should respond. Tom Lovins. Wait, wait for the microphone because what you are about to say will be recorded and held against you. It's going to show my ignorance. Uh, Smendy, so I try to get in my mind, how many covenants are there and is the old covenant the only covenant that has an effect on the, what Daniel said was the 70th, 7th, the, the tribulation in that. Is that all from the old covenant? Okay, great question. Um, well, and it's well, all about Jews. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, the last days have nothing to do with Gentiles. Uh, well, the last days will have a lot to do with Gentiles. But, but hold on to that um, as we make our way through the book of Revelation. Uh, no, uh, Revelation 6 through 19 exists um, for, for two specific reasons. For God to purify Israel, the troubling of Jacob, and for God to judge the nations, a world of Gentiles in rebellion against him. So uh, the Gentile world is very much involved. But the covenants are specific to Israel, and they include Gentiles. So if we think about the biblical covenants, uh, I don't believe uh, the, the Bible um, deals with a covenant with Adam. That's one that's often listed. Um, but if we start with Abrahamic in Genesis 12, uh, that's a promise to Abraham and his descent, a promise for people, a land, a nation, and then a blessing, and then blessings for those who bless you, curses for those who curse you, and a blessing to all the peoples. Um, and, and that flows out of a promise God made, obviously, with the gospel uh, to Satan through Eve that a, a woman would bear a seed that would crush the head of the snake, defeat sin, free us from the curse. Um, so then God makes his covenant with the people in, in Genesis 12. That's Abrahamic. You get to, um, some would call, some would identify a priestly covenant, a Levitical covenant. Um, some would talk about a Palestinian covenant specific to the land itself. I think those are both subsumed um, under other covenants. Uh, but then you get to Mosaic covenant. And in the New Testament, that's called the Old Covenant. And that was a, a bilateral agreement. You do this, you obey, you get blessings, you disobey, you get cursings. Now, in the Mosaic Covenant, there were also unilateral promises. In other words, God made promises even in Mosaic Covenant, even though we might say that's a two-way agreement. Similarly, when you get to the Davidic Covenant, 2 Samuel 7, that's the promise that from uh, Abraham through David now, there would be a, a seed or a descendant of David to sit on the throne forever. Um, that is an unconditional promise of God that that would happen. And it has conditional elements. 
It's unconditional in the sense that God will actually do it. He, there will be a descendant of David who rules the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, that is Messiah. He'll rule in his kingdom. That's still coming. Um, and it's, that's a very Jewish promise. Um, but it has a conditional element this way. Um, if any of your sons disobey David, they will be punished. And successive descendants of David disobeyed and are therefore not qualified to be Messiah. And we had to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. But unconditional covenant. So Abrahamic is unconditional. Davidic is unconditional. Mosaic, or the old covenant, was conditional. And it included new covenant in it. And then you get to new covenant, probably most fully expressed in Jeremiah 31, an unconditional covenant, picking up on the unconditional element of the Mosaic covenant, Deuteronomy 30, that God actually will bring about what Israel could never do. Changed heart from the inside. So all that trail of covenants um, is related specifically to Israel. Gentiles benefit. So we get to kind of hang on the, hang on the coattails of God's promises. What else? Since we're supposed to pray for Israel, how do you recommend that we pray? Is that too broad of a question? No, it's the question I wanted to save till the end. Oh, okay. But, great question. <laughs> Turn to Galatians chapter six. <laughs> great, it's over. We're out early. <laughs> that was very astute. Did you look at my notes? Let's get this over with. Look at Galatians six sixteen. I think we have here a window into the heart of the Apostle Paul that ought to fuel our prayer for Israel. He says, And those who will walk by this rule, peace be upon them, and also mercy upon the Israel of God. Okay, and I, if you're looking at a, a New American Standard or an English Standard Bible, you recognize I changed the word order. I, I rearranged the words according to the Greek text word order in this verse. Uh, because I think the, the English Bibles are misleading and have led some to believe that these two categories are the same. The ones who are uh, walking by gospel rule and Israel of God are the same party, right? This, this, is, uh, this is a text that people have used to say, see, the church is the new Israel. But it's not what this verse says at all. In fact, the, the, the grammar very clearly identifies two different parties and two different responses. Let's back up in Galatians just a little bit if we can. You remember the theme of Galatians, Paul is protecting the gospel from the attacks of the Judaizers. Those were Jews, who said, nope, in order to go to heaven, in order to be pleasing to God, you have to do works. You have to do specific works of Judaism. You have to be circumcised. Uh, they laid down these regulations, whether it's dietary or customs or the specific rite of circumcision as qualifications to get into heaven. And that is not the gospel. In fact, Paul says, who has bewitched you, Galatians? Who got in there and stirred up the gospel and mixed things up for you this way? It's actually damning the doctrine that you're tempted to believe. It will keep you out of heaven if you believe that something other than Christ crucified saves sinners. So this is serious stuff. And in Galatians 6, Paul closes out this argument. Look at verse 14. May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a contrast to uh, dietary restrictions, the clothes I wear, Jewish customs, or circumcision. And, and by implication, a contrast to every human work offered up as something pleasing to God. Right? This takes us back to the, probably the, the, the theme most clearly stated in Galatians in chapter 2, verse 21. I do not nullify the grace of God because if the righteousness that God demands comes through law of any sort, then Christ died needlessly. 
Of course, we would affirm Christ did not die needlessly. Therefore, righteousness, the kind of righteousness that meets God's standard, does not come through our law keeping. It does not come through our rule making. It does not come through our being religious or cleaning ourselves up or any human work. So he closes out the whole stern letter with, May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Give up everything, give up my own life just to have Christ this way. And then verse 15, For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision anything, but what is something? A new creation. Now this is stunning. This would be hard to swallow if you were a Jew. In the Old Testament, you have to be circumcised. It's a command. It would have been sin not to. In fact, God confronted the leadership of Israel when they hadn't done it. But things have changed. Barriers have come down. God has taken down walls to unite Jew and Gentile into one new body, the church. And now, circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. What is the thing? New birth. A new creation from God. Supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in the heart where we by faith embrace the gospel of grace. Anything else is a threat to grace and eternal life and the gospel itself. So verse 16, And those who will walk by this rule, peace be upon them. Great. You understand the gospel? You're not boasting in anything but Christ. You're not nullifying the grace of God. You've embraced grace alone in Christ alone. Peace of God to you. That is a, that is a greeting, uh, a rejoicing in peace purchased by the blood of Christ, assuaging the wrath of God available to everybody in the gospel. This is Paul's refrain in his openings and closings of letters, peace to you. Peace to everyone in the gospel. And, second half of the, of the verse, also, and there's two conjunctions there, and also, mercy upon the Israel of God. Mercy goes with Israel. Peace goes with gospel lovers, Jew and Gentile alike. What is Paul saying at the end of this verse? Israel still belongs to God. It is God's Israel. Possessive here. Israel is still God's. Of course, we, we know that from the other places in Scripture. God's going to keep His promises. We've been talking about the fact that this modern state of Israel still exists and that there are still Jews on the earth despite all the annihilation attempts and extermination attempts throughout history. This is a testimony of God's keeping His promise. They are still His. Now, He'll hold them accountable. We saw this in Ezekiel 20 a couple weeks ago. Um, they've got a trip to the woodshed with Jesus, as it were. They'll be out in the wilderness, confronted and pared down until an entire generation of Jews believes the gospel. That's coming, and it will be a time of trouble. But they are still his. And what does Paul say about them? Mercy. Mercy be upon them. May God have mercy on his Israel. That is what Galatians 6.16 means. And think about this from the Apostle Paul. He was hounded everywhere he went. Primarily by his countrymen. By the Jews. The Judaizers that chased him place to place to place. He would preach the resurrection. He would preach good news to the Gentiles. And the Jews were infuriated. They tried to kill him many times. In fact, it was the Jews who put the, the, the government up, the Roman government up, to arrest Paul. It was always a, a Jewish mob. You know, there were a couple places where Paul stepped on the toes of the local idolatries. You know, the fans of Diana didn't like it because the guy who made money making idols of Diana lost his business. But with a few exceptions, Paul's entire career was hounded by Jews who were opposed to the Jewish Messiah and God's promises from their own book about the gospel. You might have thought, done with them. That was not Paul's heart. We, we see Paul's heart in Romans 10. He says, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them. How shall we pray for Israel? 
is for their salvation. I testify about them. They have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge, not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Um, what does Israel need? Prayer for salvation. Um, can you pray for the geopolitical peace in the Middle East? Uh, yes, there's nothing wrong with that. Can you pray that Israel would defeat Hamas and get back all the, all the hostages? Yep. And God has already written the future history of the Middle East. It's going to get a lot worse. It's going to get a lot worse than it is now. You think about the, the, um, the, the closest kibbutz to Gaza, um, Oz, Nir, I think it was called, um, faced the, the highest percentage level of atrocities. 25% of the people in that neighborhood were killed by Hamas terrorists. One out of four. Um, the text will be in, in main service this morning. The, the fourth seal, the, the fourth horseman of the apocalypse, the judgment of God in days to come, takes that same percentage global. Authority will be given to death in Hades to wipe out a quarter of the earth's population in one judgment. If you take current population of 8.1 billion, you can do the math, two point a quarter something, a quarter of one, whatever that is. Call it two, two billion people killed in one judgment. So um, we should pray for peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Um, and, and there will be wars and rumors of war to the end. So maybe that's a convoluted answer. Um, what, what will praying for the peace of Israel mean? In the near term, pray that the gospel goes far and wide in the land of Israel, that Jews hear about Christ and believe. And Gentiles of every stripe. And, and there will be peace at an individual level. What will national peace of Israel entail? Jeremiah 30, the troubling of Jacob. Zechariah 13, 14, two-thirds of the nation cut off so that a third remains and believes the gospel. Zechariah 12, mourning in repentance and embracing Jesus as Messiah. What will it mean for Israel to have peace in the land and finally actually acquire all the territorial promises that God laid out. Um, war first. The worst the world's ever seen. And then peace when the Prince of Peace comes and brings his shalom. And we should pray for that. Let's do that. Lord, thanks for this morning. Thank you for your word. We are so privileged to be able to read to be able to read the scriptures, to have them in our language, to have so many copies available, to have the time and the, the, the freedom, the flexibility, modern conveniences to, to open up this avenue for us to know your heart and your mind. And you have laid out for us details of the future that we might live accordingly. You have told us uh, how we are to think about these things Oh God, I just pray that, that these would anchor deep in our hearts, that we would be ready with the gospel at every turn, no matter who we meet, from whatever perspective they have, that you would fill us with a heart of compassion, compassion as ambassadors for you, the King. And would you pray that, there, that our hearts would be ready to uh, intercede, to, to pray for the peace of Israel, to pray that your mercy would be upon Israel. We pray that you, for the sake of your own glory, would redeem, that you would save, that you would rescue. God, we thank you that you are one who keeps your promises. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.